This is Ross Fleming of Fleming Recordings Nelson, makers of personal phonograph records, especially those of the Kootenai Music Festival, bringing you another program of Kootenai talent and early day Kootenai history, cast as a public service in cooperation with the three Kootenai radio stations under the titles Fleming Presents over Radio CKLN Nelson, Salute to the Kootenais over Radio CJAT Trail, and Tales of the Kootenais over Radio CKEK Cranbrook. Again from the 1962 Kootenai Music Festival held in Nelson, the Nakusp Choral Speaking Junior Group recites The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear, for which they received 88 marks in the class for a choral group under 10 years. Adjudicator Ferguson said that the group had beautiful visualization, splendid spontaneity, and cooperation throughout. The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear. The Owl and the Pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some money and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy. Oh, pussy, my love. What a beautiful pussy you are. You are. You are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married. Too long we have tarried. But what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood a piggy wig stood with a ring. Shilling your ring? Said the piggy. I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mints and slices of quince, which they ate with a rustle spoon. And hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon. The moon. The moon. They danced by the light of the moon. That was the Nakusp Choral Group under 10 years. Mrs. M. Fleming conducting. J.C. Taylor of Nelson sings A. Silent Noon by Vaughn Williams and B. Would You Gain a Tender Creature by Handel, for which he received 85 and 87 marks in the class for tenor open. Adjudicator Vandergoot said that he had a good voice, but that he sang a little too heartily at times.
That was John Taylor of Nelson, an old tattered newspaper recalling the mining boom of 1890 in the West Kootenai, including many articles on historical figures, inspired a writer not long ago to write the following. Yellowed with age, but its hand-set type still clear to give a glimpse into the robust days of the early Kootenai li life, an ancient copy of The Miner, owned by M. Crawford of Creston, turned back the pages of time to October the 18th, 1890. The copy dates back beyond the preserved file of Nelson's first newspaper and is the 18th issue in the first year of the only paper in, printed in the Kootenai Lake mining districts. The names of men who came to look for fortune and stayed to build run through the advertisements, names that occupy important places in the history of the Kootenai. Pioneer hotels boasted their liquors and their cigars and their food. One alone boasted its good beds. The only two-story hotel in Nelson shouted an advertisement of the old International Hotel at the corner of Vernon and Stanley. H and T Madden were advertising their Madden house. J. Fred Hume of and Company, merchants, had stores in Revelstoke and on East Vernon Street in Nelson, while R. E. Lemon had stores at Revelstoke, Sprout, and at Nelson. Both dealers told the public about them in the paper's largest advertisements. Gilker and Wells were dealers in gents' furnishings, fancy toilet goods, patent medicines, fruit, tobaccos, cigars, and stationery, their advertisement told. H. Salou was a notary public. Hamber and Tyne were real estate and mining brokers. W. F. Tietzel and Company operated the only drugstore in Lower Kootenai at Sprout. C. W. Busk, who gave the present scout camp at Kokanee its name, was selling real estate on the West Arm. G. O. Buchanan let it be known in his ad that parties purchasing lots in Nelson to build would be liberally dealt with in regard to lumber supply by the Kootenai Lake Sawmill. Thomas Barrett was a blacksmith. Fletcher and Company provided miners' supplies, provisions, and tools at Ainsworth, along with E. S. Wilson and Company of Ainsworth and Revelstoke. Travel between Revelstoke and Sprout was aboard the steamer Lytton of the Columbia and Kootenai Steam Navigation Company. Here, too, there was progress and advancement. A new story told that the Nelson Sawmill Company had been advised by the Navigation Company to get out lumber for the construction of a second boat for Kootenai trade. There is also word about, uh, about that D. C. Corbin planned a boat that could take the run between Sprout and the Dells in one day. A government land sale was in progress at the time of the issue. John Hewson and Charles Inc. of old-time newspaper fame were prominent among the purchasers, taking one lot, it was told, merely to show outsiders that they had faith in the mines on Toad Mountain. One, no one wanted Lot 21, the story recorded, it being in Ward Creek. Other property buyers were William H. Elson, George H. Wood, Harry Wigman, R. E. Lemon, D. McGilvery, Dr. E. C. Arthur, Joe Wilson, J. E. Walsh, James R. Buchanan, G. O. Buchanan, and Thomas Madden. No hint as to the editor of the historical journal was given in its editorial page masthead. However, there's room for a good guess in the fact that John Houston with Charles H. Inc. and W. Gessner Allen were operating a real estate business in an office of the minor building, Baker Street, according to an advertisement. Somewhat of a lack of admiration for things English were found occasionally in its news pages. For example, the miner closed an inside page news story on a London fire brigade arriving seven hours too late for a fire uh, with the comment, then again the English are, for ec economical reasons, opposed to such artificial heat as that afforded by stoves, furnaces, and grates. They believe it is cheaper to put four pence worth of gin in their stomach than tuppence worth of coal in the grate. That is why 50% are drunkards, and 50% have Qatar, but it lessens the rate of fire insurance. Ainsworth was then in its heyday. 
the promise of its mines, searching prospectors, and assay figures had turned the spotlight on the attention of on the Hot Springs district. In reports on activity at Hot Springs, as Ainsworth was then sometimes called, it was noted that the best uh, smelter was to be made it uh, its was to have made its first f trial run on Friday, October the 17th, 1890. A Dr. Campbell of the Revelstoke Mining Company was there making arrangements for the winter operation of the United and Number One properties. The optimism of the time was revealed in reports on mining act activities. From Trail Creek reads a story in the yellowed front page, news comes in a roundabout way that a Mr. Dwyer who visited the camp to make an expert uh, report on for Seattle parties, says its ore bodies are equal, if not far ahead of those on the Toad Mountain or Hot Springs districts. From a 500-pound sample, he had assays of $147 in gold. There is said to be much activity in the camp, and miners are making quite extensive preparations for the winter. This was the type of ore that was later to bring to Rossland the reputation as the Golden City. On Rover Creek goes another yarn. The owners of the Whitewater are more than jubilant. They are millionaires. They claim to have one of the richest properties in Toad Mountain District. And in many tons of ore, and if many tons of ore are in sight as good as the specimens on exhibition at Nelson, their claims are based on a pretty solid foundation. Recent assays by Ellis of Nelson gave $204 in gold and $24 in silver to the ton. The cracked and aged pa uh, pages record the death by drowning of Thomas F. Burns, a pioneer of the Hot Springs District, and a brother of John Burns, who is later to become a, b a leading building contractor and is now a resident at Ainsworth. A search was also underway at the time for the body of John Sandon, a rancher near Ainsworth, who it was believed had drowned. The Silver King, high on Toad Mountain above Nelson, was then pouring out its wealth and providing impetus to the stir of mining activity that gave early life to Nelson. The, an the ancient miner reported that Wilson's p pack train had brought down today the last sack of the 2,500 shipped. The shipment represents a value of over $40,000. The tunnel was now in about 260 feet. Tenders for excavation work at the Narrows were being called for by W.A. Bailey Groman, manager of a company attempting to reclaim the bottomlands on Kootenai River, lying between the boundary line and the head of the lake. Groman uh, Creek below Nelson was named after this same engineer. The miner was not given to tooting its own horn, it broadly pro proclaimed, but it must be valuable as an advertising medium or the greatest railway on earth would not, uh, would not occupy four inches of its space at the same rates charged local advertisers. The miner is a good institution, it adds mildly. So is the CPR. Pungent was some of its comment. There is a coal oil famine in Nelson. It would be much better for the town and its inhabitants if there was a whiskey famine. But somehow, whiskey is an article of commerce that dealers always carry in stock. For our early day phonograph recording, we are playing My Lovin' Sing Song Man by Al Bernard and F. Camplin, produced about the same time as our story. Cause I love you. 
ain't your son. Uh-huh. You always was a singer, ain't your son? Uh-huh. You know, I remember the first song you ever sung to me. Uh-huh. It was at the picnic. We were singing it together, and it was so pretty that Parson Brown's old jazz music <laughs> just had a giant in the chorus. What was it? It was something about my name. I think it was my folk name. What is my folk name, anyway? Don't you it? You know the song I mean. Uh-huh. That was an Edison Cylinder record from our Frank Stringer collection. Back to the Kootenai Music Festival, Marilyn Benson plays Minuet in G Major with Variations, for which she received 86 marks in the class for piano forte under 14 years. Adjudicator Gustin said that this was very good playing of a difficult English minuet. She was told that she played artistically with good phrasing and a musical theme. That was Marilyn Benson of Rossland. And so we've come to the end of another of Kootenay's own programs produced by Fleming Recordings Nelson as a public service and broadcast through the courtesy of your radio station. See you next Sunday. This is Ross Fleming saying so long, partners. Bye.